Tonight, the federal government sticks a big tariff on electric vehicles made in China. If it's going to be quite literally double the price, no one's going to buy it. We've got the politics, the industry reaction, and the impact on Canadian car buyers. Some outdoor spaces are shut down in Massachusetts, response to a rare but dangerous mosquito virus. You can have a, a decreased level of consciousness and, and seizures. An urgent call to action from urban firefighters. Climate change disasters are becoming more frequent. We're not confident that we're prepared. What to do when wildfire comes right into town. From CBC News, this is The National with Christine Barak. Thanks for joining us. Adrian is away. With new tariffs and new rules for employers, the federal Liberals are taking aim tonight at two pressing issues as they gather to plot out their year ahead. Hoping to protect Canada's developing electric vehicle industry from cheaper options made overseas, they're announcing a major new tariff on any coming in from China. The government's also cutting the number of temporary foreign workers allowed into Canada and signaling more immigration changes could be coming. The announcements came at the Liberal Cabinet retreat now underway in Halifax, whereas Ashley Burke explains the party is trying to turn a corner. The Prime Minister and his Cabinet under pressure to turn their political troubles around. I think the challenges we're facing are real. And, uh, and we're not the only country facing these challenges, but we have to be better at it to make sure that we're delivering results, period. After a year of the worst polling that Justin Trudeau has seen as Liberal leader, he chose this Cabinet retreat to announce new initiatives. We are taking action. A crackdown on a massive influx of temporary foreign workers that experts warn is fueling unemployment among immigrants and young people. Tightening the rules and restricting eligibility to reduce the number of low-wage temporary foreign workers in Canada, with exceptions in certain industries like healthcare, construction and food security. The Canadian government also now taking action in line with the U.S by slapping tariffs on China, including a 100% tariff on electric vehicles made there. That move to try and stop China from flooding Canada with heavily subsidized EVs hurting the industry here. Chinese policy of oversupply and overcapacity built on. You know what it's built on? It is built on abysmal labor standards and it is built on abysmal environmental standards. China calls that baseless and is threatening consequences. If you listen to Pierre Polyev, but all that news didn't distract from questions wacko. about why Trudeau wants to stay on as leader for the election expected next year. The only cabinet shuffle that uh, that needs to happen is that this prime minister uh, needs to go. But to those who say his time is up, defiance. All of us here have tremendous confidence in the prime minister. We have confidence in him as the leader of our government, as the Prime Minister of Canada, and we have confidence him, in him as our party's leader. Ashley, what did the Prime Minister himself say about his leadership? Well, Christine, he was asked by reporters if there were any lessons that he's learned from what's unfolding south of the border where there's an election underway. The Democrats changed their leader and they saw a bump in the polls, but Trudeau rejected any suggestion that his party could benefit from a change at the very top and said that the big lessons he's learned is that they need to deliver on issues that Canadians are worrying about. Now, some of his own caucus members hope that this retreat will lead to a major reset for the party, including a big cabinet shuffle. But so far, there are no signs of that shuffle happening. Thanks, Ashley. Our Ashley Burke in Halifax. That EV tariff is meant to protect the Canadian industry that's just getting started from the much more advanced one in China. But as Nisha Patel shows us, consumers will feel what that means in the price they pay. Charge limit set to 90 percent. At this electric vehicle dealership in Oakville, Ontario, it's clear what buyers are looking for. The more options out there, the more competition and the, maybe the better rates and better deals. But the federal government's steep new 100 percent tariff is designed to make Chinese-made EVs less attractive. Now if it's going to be quite literally double the price, no one's going to buy it. Ottawa's move is meant to protect EV manufacturing here at home. 
and the billions of taxpayer dollars invested in the emerging industry. Automakers say this will buy them some time to shift into high gear. We can build up this EV supply chain and Canada can secure its role in the transformation to electric that is taking place globally in the automotive industry. The most immediate hit will be to Tesla, which builds EVs for the Canadian market in Shanghai. Though the company could avoid the import tax by shifting production to a different country. Still, it's Chinese brands like BYD that are seen as the greatest threat. Experts say they ignore environmental and labor standards and are heavily subsidized by the government, giving them an unfair advantage. It's very important for us to have a level playing field. The Chinese are very good at what they do, but what they do also includes breaking the rules. In China, the BYD Seagull sells for the equivalent of $13,000. In an overseas market like Mexico, a similar BYD model costs $25,000. In Canada, one of the cheapest EVs available is the Fiat 500e. Built in Italy, it's priced here at more than $42,000. Building a plant in the U.S. or Canada would be beneficial to BYD. We fully expect something to be announced for Canada or uh, a quick growth of a plant that they plan in Mexico. The new rules will be in place for at least a year, but they likely can't keep companies like BYD away for good. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. In the U.S., a rare but potentially deadly disease spread by mosquitoes has a cluster of communities in the state of Massachusetts on high alert tonight. Allison Northcott has more on that and the risk here at home. Several towns in Massachusetts are now critical risk zones for a serious mosquito-borne illness. I don't know if I wouldn't go out, I'd probably just wear long pants and long sleeves. Communities across the U.S. state are trying to prevent the spread of eastern equine encephalitis after a rare case was reported in a man in his 80s. A headache, a fever, um, but because of the inflammation of the brain, you can have a, a decreased level of consciousness and, and seizures. Infectious disease specialists say it can be dangerous and deadly. It's a pretty catastrophic infection. It can cause a very, very severe syndrome of encephalitis, which means inflammation of the brain, and it carries a, a rather high mortality rate. Officials in Massachusetts are spraying widely, some towns closing parks and fields and urging residents to avoid outdoor activities during peak mosquito hours from dusk until dawn. Please don't do this to our kids. 800 people signed a petition. Health Canada says the last reported human case of the disease in this country was in 2016. But health officials in the city of Ottawa say a horse there recently tested positive. So they're encouraging residents to use insect repellent, wear light-coloured long pants and long sleeves, make sure windows and doors have screens, and remove or empty standing water sites around your home. The virus has no cure or vaccine for humans, but Canadians shouldn't panic, says this expert. Outbreaks of this particular disease in the United States and in New England it's usually only very small handfuls of cases. Canada's public health agency monitors mosquito-borne diseases, but it says unlike West Nile virus, human cases of eastern equine encephalitis don't have to be reported to the agency and there's no formal surveillance system in place. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Russia has carried out one of its biggest aerial attacks on Ukraine since the beginning of its invasion. This one targeted electrical grids, forcing rolling blackouts. Cameron McIntosh now on the wide-ranging assault and the heavy price paid by civilians. The barrage saw Russian missiles and drones strike at critical energy infrastructure across Ukraine, including this reservoir near Kyiv and this power plant. Ukraine says most regions in the country were hit, killing at least six people, injuring at least another 30. A farmer among those killed in a direct hit on his home. I was very scared from the explosion, says his sister. I was still shaking. I couldn't recognize there was black dust everywhere. In the capital of Kyiv, these residents waited out the attack by singing a song of resistance. The Ukrainian government says at least 120 missiles and 100 drones were fired. It managed to shoot some of them down, but authorities say there's enough damage to force rolling blackouts. The attack comes on the same day the Kremlin spoke of the need to respond to Ukraine's seizure of territory in western Russia. 
The Russian Defense Ministry says it targeted infrastructure critical to Ukraine's war effort, along with two electronic warfare stations and four field ammunition depots. But neighboring Poland, a NATO member says the Russian attack may have crossed into its airspace. These Polish soldiers searching for a Russian drone believed to have been shot down. We're conducting a search near the border so that there's no doubt here, said Poland's deputy minister of defense. Unclear is how NATO may respond. U.S. President Joe Biden has repeatedly warned Russia against incursions into NATO territory. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky is calling on the U.S. and European allies to help bolster Ukraine's long-range air defenses. In this statement posted to X, he also said Ukraine's efforts to eliminate Russian threats on Russian territory are vital to Ukraine's defense, again asking for permission to use NATO weapons to carry out those missions, a request that has so far gone unanswered. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. More than one million polio vaccines have arrived in Gaza. The territory recently confirmed its first case of the potentially deadly disease in more than 25 years. The United Nations says it's now working on plans to administer the shots to more than 640,000 children. However, UN workers say a new evacuation order by Israel's military is forcing humanitarian operations to move yet again, creating another hurdle in delivering the life-saving vaccines. We continue to hope for, for, for the best, and, and, we, and we have to, because without that, everything is gone. But look, the, the past 10 months have just told us that the only thing we can say with any certainty is that tomorrow will be worse than, than today. The UN is asking for humanitarian pauses in order to carry out its vaccination campaign. It says the 10-month-old who was diagnosed with polio is stable, but partially paralyzed. In the U.S. presidential campaign, Donald Trump is looking to regain the country's attention following last week's high-profile Democratic National Convention. Katie Simpson looks at what appears to be Trump's key tactic, make as many appearances as possible. Get ready for more Donald Trump. On this Monday alone, he made four public stops, including a wreath-laying ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery and a speech to National Guard members in Battleground, Michigan. The strategy is to go full out, as Trump is urged to embrace a more serious tone. So I told President Trump then and now, you're going to win this thing if you focus on policy. As he does, Trump stuck to a mix of what he wants, paying tribute to U.S. soldiers killed during the chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. They will live in our hearts forever. Trump did not address his past derogatory statements, reportedly calling veterans losers and suckers, but he did veer into derogatory comments about his opponents. Which is better, being stupid or being incompetent? Because they're both stupid, these people were to allow this to happen to our country. Going after Kamala Harris, her running mate, and former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She's crazy as a bedbug, that one. <laughs> She's nuts. She's a nut. Republicans are trying to steal the spotlight back from Democrats after last week's high energy convention. The Harris campaign says it's raised more than $540 million so far. And obviously the Democrats are on a sugar high. Everybody's acknowledged that. People are hurting. And this whole joy love fest doesn't exist in the real world. Republicans accuse Harris of hiding. She's not done an interview or held a news conference since her campaign began. It's unclear if she will before the next presidential debate. That debate, which is set for September 10th, may be in doubt. Both the Harris and Trump teams are bickering over the terms, and Trump has questioned why he should even do it. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. More than 100 people had to be rescued after flash flooding in the Grand Canyon. The Arizona National Guard used a Black Hawk helicopter to get them to safety. Monsoon storms started last Thursday, triggered the flooding. One woman was swept away by the muddy waters. Her body was located on Sunday. 
and one person is dead. Three others are injured after a landslide in southern Alaska. Several homes and businesses were also damaged. Heavy rainfall is to blame. Some residents have been ordered to leave their homes. Officials warn a second landslide is possible. A new report on last year's Halifax area wildfire shows how local firefighters were overmatched by the blaze. Nicola Segan looks at the lessons for communities across the country as more and more wildfires roar into urban areas. The fire in May 2023 erupted on a sunny Sunday afternoon. Walls of smoke towering over neighborhoods in Halifax's suburbs as flames edged the roads and thousands scurried to get out. Firefighters went in. The level of destruction, uh, the speed that the fire was moving, um, the amount of people trying to be evacuated were all uh, extreme compared to what we've dealt with in the past. It was one of the largest wildfires ever recorded in the Halifax area. 151 homes were destroyed across nine square kilometers. We remember very well the suffering caused by this event. A new report from Halifax's fire department spells out the challenge to urban firefighters used to fighting fires in homes and other structures. Those first responders didn't have the proper training, experience or equipment and were quickly overwhelmed. Experts say to expect more of that across the country as climate change and urban sprawl bring wildfires to urban areas more often. We're calling it the intersection of hazards, right? Things are just expanding beyond our normal borders of where municipalities used to be involved. Though specialized wildfire teams usually take the lead, municipal firefighters must also respond, as in Jasper, Alberta, just last month, and in the BC community of Lytton and throughout the Shuswap region in the past three years. We're seeing more and more communities impacted. There's more development on the landscape, but there's also more fire. Halifax Fire's report gave 56 recommendations, including expanded training, new equipment, and an updated wildfire response strategy. Climate change disasters are becoming more frequent. We're not confident that we're prepared. The firefighters that head into the flames, saying there's no time to waste. Nicholas Sagan, CBC News, Halifax. Australia has given workers the right to not respond to emails or take calls outside of work hours, something that already exists for some workers in this country. When you are disconnected with work, uh, you, you are kind of disconnected with a lot of stress. But does the right to disconnect actually work? That's next. Plus, one player, one game, two different teams. It looks a little strange seeing Danny Jansen on the field wearing different colors. How the Blue Jays and the Red Sox made history. And later, dueling signs grow into an all-out marquee showdown. We all get along with each other. We're just trying to have some lighthearted fun. The war of words that just kept spreading. We're back in two. Airport parking provider Park and Fly says the personal information of one million customers was accessed in a data breach. Names, emails and mailing addresses were compromised between July 11th and 13th, but not payment information. Affected customers have been contacted by Park and Fly. Australia has rolled out a new law, giving most people the right to ignore their bosses when they're off the clock. Angie Seff now on how it works and the push for a similar plan in Canada. The right to disconnect has arrived in Australia. The new law allowing employees to ignore work emails and calls after work hours will apply to all businesses with 15 or more employees. The change was made in an effort to promote work-life balance. When you are disconnected with work, uh, you, you are kind of disconnected with a lot of stress, anxiety and all those deadlines and all those kind of things. The law isn't absolute. Employers can still call. And there are some cases that are considered reasonable. Similar rules are in place in more than 20 other countries around the world. This budget is about fairness for every generation. And Canada is looking to get on board, introducing a plan in the last federal budget. Ontario is the only province to give workers the right to disconnect, requiring companies with more than 25 employees to have a written policy. It sounds good, but it's a bit of an empty policy. Enforcement. 
still an issue, according to this labor lawyer. The law doesn't actually tell employers that they have to mandate that employees disconnect between certain periods. So without that level of guidance, employers are free to draft these policies in any way they see fit. Though some say change is coming either way, with younger generations demanding it. You know, it's very clear that the younger workforce wants to establish more clear boundaries between work and outside of work life. And some of those younger workers say employers who don't listen could face consequences. I'm done at 3.30, so for your information, I'm not going to message you back. Even if I see my messages, you're going to be on Do Not Disturb. It should be available as an option, and it's definitely an appealing tactic that employees can use to attract uh, any applicants, right? Canada's plan is still a ways away with work to be done to update the labour code. Even then, it'll only affect federally regulated workers, leaving it up to the provinces and territories to make their own call. Angie Seth, CBC News, Toronto. Major League Baseball history was made today in Boston as the Jays took on the Red Sox. One of those you know, crazy things about this game and definitely an oddity. How one player played for both teams in the same game. Plus, life and death in a small Ontario city. Everybody we love and know is dead. On the front lines of the opioid crisis, frustrations boiling over. You are allowing that disaster to happen outside the church. The search for answers and the fight to save lives. The National breaks down the stories shaping our world next. This is Manette Bailey celebrating her 102nd birthday by skydiving from a small plane with a little help. Completing the two kilometer jump makes Bailey Britain's oldest skydiver on record. And it wasn't her first time thrill seeking. She drove a race car over 200 kilometers per hour to mark her 100th birthday. Well done, congratulations. Well, Major League Baseball is well known for its quirky statistics, and today it had another one for the first time. In a game between the Toronto Blue Jays and the Boston Red Sox, one player suited up for both teams. Jamie Strachan shows us the perfect storm that made it happen. At Boston's Fenway Park, another quirky chapter in baseball's rich history. You know, there's always a chance you can come to the ballpark and see something you've never seen before. It's going to happen today, and it involves Danny Jansen. Catcher Danny Jansen did what no other player has ever done, becoming the first major leaguer to play for both teams in the same game. Definitely grateful for the uh, opportunity to be in that position. Um, one of those you know, crazy things about this game, and uh, definitely an oddity. Wait, what? How is this even possible? That sounds weird, right? Flashback to exactly two months ago when this game began. Jansen, the longtime Toronto Blue Jays backstop, fouled off the first pitch of his at bat. Then the skies opened up. The game was paused, and when the rain didn't let up, it was not resumed until Monday. Two months is a long time in baseball, and a lot has happened since then, to say the least. For one thing, Jansen was traded from the Jays to the Red Sox. It looks a little strange seeing Danny Jansen on the field wearing different colors. When the game resumed, there he was behind the plate. But remember, he had been the batter when it was paused, so a different Blue Jay player had to complete his at-bat. It's pretty fitting that Jano will be the first guy to do that. He's, he's that kind of guy. Um, you know, it's weird stuff happens to him. So now for the second time, here comes Danny Jansen. Every season, there are a handful of suspended games. And because of trades or injuries, the original lineups are often different, but nothing ever like this. The box score will be sent, his uniform will be sent, his cleats will be sent, everything that will be sent up to, uh, up, up to the Baseball Hall of Fame. And a liner into In the end, Jansen's performance was pretty ordinary. He had a single in four bats and struck out to end the game. Jansen goes around. But he's now a part of baseball lore. Jamie Strash and CBC News, Toronto. For the record, the Jays took that one four to one. Now it's time to dig deeper into the stories shaping our world. We are in a serious and deadly toxic drug death crisis with no coordinated tables or emergency task forces to address it. Frontline workers condemn Ontario's plan to shut down 10 supervised consumption sites. With this new policy, thousands of people in Toronto will die 
The province is instead promising to invest in facilities focused on treatment. Ontario's Premier believes supervised consumption isn't the way to go. I've dealt with it within our family. I've dealt with it within our community. Uh, it, that does not work. The debate over how to tackle a spiraling addiction crisis is raging, especially in Belleville, Ontario, where the overdose crisis got so bad, the city declared a state of emergency. Omar Debagi Pacheco traveled there to try and get at the heart of the crisis. We're talking about people dying in dumpsters. For following breaking news out of Ontario, the city of Belleville has declared a state of emergency. We lost four people in 40 days to life on the streets. I thought you were dead. I thought you were dead. It was an animal tranquilizer and was killing us all. Chaos, chaos, destruction, and lack of law and order. The city is dealing with an overdose crisis. Last Saturday, I had to call 911. Go find an address now. Because someone was ODing out back. The mayor says that the city's emergency services and health care system are close to a breaking point. I'm walking by people smoking fentanyl every day. and. It's just nonchalant. People nodding off, <sighs> nearing death, and you know, it's just a, another stroll in the park. How did a small town in Ontario make national headlines? My producer Ryan and I, we wanted to know, and so we drove to Belleville to meet up with the people witnessing it firsthand. Like in November, it was very much a, a similar situation with a lot more people going down than there ever was now. We just got to Belleville and the mayor is about to have a press conference where we're hoping to find out the latest on the emergency situation in this city. Police say they've intercepted some drugs. The majority of those drugs were coming from the GTA. Belleville's mayor wants to open a new center. But we need a lot more money. He wants residents to help pay for it, and that's adding to their frustrations. It's aimed at the people running the center. I interviewed 90 people up and down the street. 89 of them were so frustrated and angry because you are allowing that disaster to happen outside the church. Okay? How can we keep our That's businesses it. running? It's a good question. Right? You know, like, and that good question has been going on for two yeah. years. Yeah. That's and not I, acceptable anymore. This is Belleville, Ontario, in a state of emergency, and this is the epicenter of the overdose crisis. A couple weeks ago, on this block, in the span of about an hour, a bunch of people started to collapse. It's a city at a breaking point, and we wanted to find out how it got so bad. That's Jennifer Cormier, JJ. She agrees to show us around. She's the head of the John Howard Society, runs the drop-in center. She's taking care of a lot of people. Um, you okay? Take a couple deep breaths for me, okay? Okay. Wayne, his lips were blue earlier, okay? So when the drop-in initially was opened, it was for 15 individuals who needed to be off the street because of the... Uh, provincial rules and that's grown now to 200 so we see about an average of 108 to 115 unique individuals every day. The city says the solution is moving all of this across town to Alhambra Square, run services 24 hours a day and boost JJ's staffing but that plan is still about a year away and some residents they want this all of it gone. If we were to close up the drop-in today and say we're going to wait until one Alhambra is open. Um, eight months to a year down the road from eight, what the mayor was saying. Right. Eight months to a year. These individuals are going to end up in people's backyards. We get the sense that there's nowhere else to go. Um, I've been homeless for six years and before these guys opened we had nothing. Nowhere to go and get banned from everywhere and once it's open it's just like home like during the day, it keeps us warm and safe. Last couple of weeks have been a wake-up call. People tell us the violence, it's gotten worse. They've had to hire security guards. I'm prepared for my job. I prepare. I know that I'm going to potentially run into an overdose or two. But to have six in less than five minutes was frightening. And they weren't responsive. And it just, it was really overwhelming. We keep hearing the drugs are changing. Animal tranquilizers, benzodiazepines. They're not the drugs that people were used to. People are just seeing it because it's here on the streets, but you've been living it for much longer. How do you understand what's happening right now? It started four years ago. This didn't start recently for any of us. 
This has backfired and bit every single one of us. Everybody we love and know is dead. Not everybody is a statistic. We um, are not pieces of garbage. We are a part of the community. It is us that is that we are the ones that are, are being killed off by this drug. A month and a half ago, I overdosed. And between the staff here and a couple of the family big brothers here, the CPR that they had to do was extensive because of the trank. It absolutely put me out to the point that they didn't know what to do. So in order to save me, it not only took two different Narcan injections and a nasal, it took extensive CPR. Her lips were purple, her cheeks were purple, her nose was purple. I flipped, I flipped her over and I thought, I thought you were dead. I thought you were dead. And it takes longer to bring them back because it's a different drug. So it, like we, she died like three times. Everyone we talked to here told us they need a safe place to call home. But they also tell us if they can't kick fentanyl first, they're not going to be able to keep their place. You're talking about the cost of housing is just out of this world. And then you're talking about all those other systems that have broken down and there's no resources. So where where do they go for help and, and how do they get it? We're family. We're family here. You know, I walk, the hardest part for me every day is shutting that door. So if this is your family and your family's on the streets, when you do get housing, how difficult (laughs) Difficult. is it to move on? Because in a sense, it's like, from what you've been telling me... I'm leaving them here to, to die. Housing. It's supposed to be the solution, but for the people who live on the streets, they see that as an impossible choice between shelter and the family that they've come to know on the streets. But for the people who live and work downtown, they say it's a situation that just can't go on. Okay, so this and is so, our bistro. Okay. We've been here for 16 years. Remember the residents who were angry with JJ and the state of Bridge Street? We wanted to understand where that frustration was coming from. Part of our challenges are we have just like a little community tip pot. People will come in, they will uh, steal the money. This particular individual that I have on video, she's been in here five times. She goes right over to my customers, goes into their pockets and takes their money. And I, I don't have, we don't have the budget to hire extra people to, to stop that. Last Saturday, I had to call 911 at 5.30 because someone was ODing out back. And, you know, I, I feel have compassion for that, but it's very challenging when you're trying to run a business. Over to the right here used to be our stairs. We had a, a man and a wife living there. Um, and they, for they were there for two weeks. They just literally wouldn't leave because I had started giving them food. There's no one in this community that doesn't want to help, but it's at a level that it's so difficult and we are enabling it. We met a lot of other people downtown. They wanted us to know what's been happening outside their doors. And then they showed us this. Okay, go find an address now. No, I'm calling, I'm to I've already called somebody. I'm on oh. the phone with them now. So what's been the impact on this town from, from where you're staying? Chaos. Chaos, destruction, and lack of law and order. Smashed windows, uh, people defecating. Uh, uh, you say homeless, but I, I think a lot of that is uh, addiction uh, problems. Uh, urinating anywhere, uh, casting garbage everywhere. Just a lack of respect for a community that feeds them. What seems to be happening here that's really affecting all of us is the drug culture and the drug dealing and the theft that happens with that. I personally feel that the one program that we have up the street is kind of broken because it's really overflowing down into the businesses and it's and it's really affecting their livelihood. My worry is that um, if it doesn't change for the better, uh, people are really going to burn out and our community will suffer. Okay, but let's take a step back here for a second because to be clear, this issue is really concentrated on a few blocks of downtown. In a small city of about 50,000 people, That can feel like a lot, but not everyone is at the end of their rope. And people went out of their way to tell us that. For me, the general feeling is uh, a lot of sympathy, really. I mean, this is part of our community. This is, these are people that are loved ones to um, lots of, you know, friends and family, other employees, other businesses that we have. These are all, you know, known people. And we, I don't feel that um, we're really doing enough. Back on Bridge Street, some people tell us this is their hometown, and they've lost a lot of people. That last round of overdoses, it took Sarah's husband, Channing. They found him in a dumpster. In four years, this started with my dad and ended with my husband. My mother died two weeks before him, fentanyl overdose, at 60 years old. 
Channing was only 38. He just turned 38. That's a thread we keep hearing. Loss and a lack of support. Me, myself, I always wanted to be a, a family man. I had that dream, and, and we were introduced to certain drugs, and it went to hell. I, um, for me to get clean and stay clean, I need a stable home. I, being out here, it's just massive depression all the time. You get stuck in that rut, and you finally give up. Like, I've pretty much given up. There has to be housing that's affordable to begin with and supported. And so I think until that happens, you're just creating a revolving door. After the break, we'll walk the beat with one of Belleville's police officers. They're using fentanyl because they don't want to feel anymore. They're defeated. The challenges law enforcement is facing in the midst of a toxic drug crisis. That's next. An Ontario city caught in the grip of a deadly toxic drug crisis. I flipped her over and I thought, I thought you were dead. I thought you were dead. A community struggling to balance compassion with concern. Urinating anywhere, uh, casting garbage everywhere, just a lack of respect for a community that feeds them. Before the break, you heard from people at the heart of Belleville's overdose emergency. In the second part of his documentary, Omar Debaggy Pacheco talks to officials who have a warning for other communities. This is the epitome of a revolving door. I, I talk to people about the bail system and they go, well, what do you mean they let hardcore drug dealers out that have guns on them? Constable Aaron Crawford, we've been wanting to talk to him since we got here. And just before we need to head back, he gets the green light to go on camera. How do you describe what's happening here right now in Belleville? Um, I would say that this is the crux of um, poor policy and poor decision um, all come to a head all at the same time. Um, you have uh, a legal system uh, that's incredibly soft on crime and on criminals. You have a mental health system that's, quite frankly, failing uh, tax-paying and non-tax-paying citizens here in Ontario. And um, things are kind of at their breaking point. This is the result. You have people that are unmedicated, unwell, and they're medicating themselves with drugs on the street. Uh, fentanyl, uh, they're using fentanyl because they don't want to feel anymore. They're defeated. He tells us he's been watching things go from bad to worse, knows most people by name, either because he's tried to save them or because he's arrested them over and over again. I mean, if I charge someone for theft or mischief, they go to the courthouse, they get released because they're trying to fund their addiction. If I take them to the hospital, they don't get held because they're in a drug-induced psychosis. It just seems that there's just nowhere for these people to go. We ask him about those concerns that the residents brought up, about the thefts, the break-ins, the vandalism. It's either I bring them to court, get them charged or charge them, and they're not held accountable for the criminal act that they're doing. Um, and again, I think it's because of, out of reasons of compassion. Um, but then, they're also not being uh, institutionalized. I could introduce you to a couple people, probably at 60 Bridge, who would ramble on and make no sense, would not be able to have a full-fledged conversation like you or I are having right now. And that's because of their mental health issues. And for me not to be able to bring someone to a place that can actually look after that person, because right now, that type of a person cannot look after themselves, and they are being left on the street. That As is frustrating. Picking up the same people for the same crimes day after day. He says he tries to get them help instead of laying charges, but there is no help anywhere. So after a few arrests... Eventually it comes to a head where we're charging people for the crimes that they're committing. Smashing windows, thefts, um, all the things that probably you're hearing are affecting the downtown area. And we're sending them to the courts, and the courts are essentially saying this person may be doing these things because they're in a, 
in the midst of a mental health crisis. And that would bring us to our bail system. Uh, so our bail system, um, people are getting released left, right and center for the same crimes over and over and over again. Has the system failed you, your city? I think that the system's failed <laughs> a lot of communities, not just Belleville. Just look at the last two weeks. I mean, we're talking about people dying in dumpsters. We're talking about people that are dying on the front of a sidewalk uh, that they've been released to. Um, I just shake my head at, at people who, I just shake my head and kind of go, why, how do the people that are in charge not see that they're the ones causing some of this? So we head back to Bridge Street, right behind the church. We're starting to see this building in a whole new light. Everyone's concerned, no one's got an answer. My hope is that we, as a community, can collectively come together and say, okay, what can we do that works for everyone? And, you know, I understand, I'm, I'm a mother, I have a child. I understand that mindset of not necessarily wanting your child to see this. But the harsh reality is this is real. It's real. These people are real. And this isn't just a Belleville issue. This is countrywide. We are seeing it everywhere, the states, everywhere. And, you know, so there's obviously there's more to it than just a church. Before we leave town, we have to see the site of this new center. And this is it. Underfunded and a long ways away from being of any help. It's been the end of a full two days here in Belleville, and we've spoken to everyone who would speak to us. Everyone's got a different idea of what a solution looks like, but like this one, they're all long-term. The one thing that everyone seems to agree on is that the systems that were supposed to be in place to prevent this from happening, they failed, and it's the people who live here who are paying the price. And actually, it's a price being paid by all Canadians. The most recent numbers show opioid use costs in this country more than $7 billion a year. Much of that in lost productivity, criminal justice, and health care. Next, signs in North Carolina create a spectacle. We're just a small community. We all get along with each other. We're just trying to have some lighthearted fun. The cheeky battle of the businesses in our moment. The sign that kicked it all off. Dank Burrito, a restaurant in North Carolina, taking shots at a nearby business as part of a friendly rivalry. Soon others started getting involved and it spiraled out of control. Tonight, the war of words makes our moment. A business across the street put up a happy birthday sign on their marquee and left it up for about a week or two, maybe longer. We poked a little bit of fun at them saying, hey, quit being lazy, change your sign. And they followed up with, we're not busy, we're just busier than you. And we've gone back and forth with them a couple of times. And then other businesses have just followed in their, their steps and have contributed to it. What they don't realize is when you have a 30-foot marquee and you're having to put letters up, it gets exhausting after a while. County's buzzing, you can hear the roar. Sign was 2024, the stakes are high. So we put our sign up that said, hey guys, do we need to talk about it? Dang burrito clocked back at us and said that we needed to stay out of it because this was nacho uh, beef, I think. Even the surrounding counties are starting to get in on this now. It just shows that we're just a small community. We all get along with each other. We're just trying to have some lighthearted fun. There's no hostility in any of the signs that we put up whatsoever. It's just all in good fun. They're so clever. Well, in the midst of that sign war, someone actually started a fundraiser to pay student lunch debts. They raised enough to cover all outstanding lunch payments from the last school year, all of this year, and possibly some of next year's lunches. And the friendly war of words is not over yet. Well, from all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Christine Birak. Take care.